Welcome to uh, tonight's Tanya class. We are studying Tanya. We are in the uh, last uh, section of Tanya called Egeret HaKodesh. And we're holding Peri Gutes, the 19th chapter in Egeret HaKodesh. And as always, we say that every single chapter, because it's the foundation of mysticism, has a healthy and complete theme. Um, so the theme of tonight's chapter, chapter Yutes, Peri Gutes in Egeret HaKodesh, is um, about the power of Torah. Torah, as we know, is extremely powerful. What does that mean? What does that mean like this? God is infinite. God is infinite. Infinite, it's hard for us even to comprehend what infinite means, because infinite means there's no end. We're finite. But God's infinite. Whatever our minds can allow us to imagine, infinite energy, infinite. Right? Go explain infinite. You can't. So God is infinite. We are finite. We're finite. We're physical people. We're here. We can't be there. For example, a lot of people want to be tonight in two places. <laughs> you can't be in two places at once. If you're, if you're finite, you're physical. You're either here or you're there. You have to pick. Time, space. We can only be in one, spa one space, space, time, this time, and this, etc. So we're finite. Now, but God wanted us to have a connection to Him. So how does finite have a connection with infinite? Because if finite becomes infinite, then it's not finite anymore. And if infinite comes into finite, then it's not finite anymore, but it's infinite. So how do you have the connection? So God gave us a gift called the Torah. And the Torah has both components. On one hand, the Torah has a component of infinite. And on the other hand, the Torah has a component of finite. What does that mean? So the author quotes from a verse that says, Oita er kesalma, which, um, which a verse in actually is in Psalms. Where, he, with the, where the author explains the verse to mean that the one hand Torah has er, light, and we know light resembles infinite. For example, light is infinite. If you had the proper light, you can see everything, right? Not only physical light, but spiritual light. On the other hand, kasalma, it's a shield because, for example, the Torah speaks about physical things. You learn the Torah. You don't learn, wow, you're flying off into La La Land. So you sit down to learn Torah, whether it's Chumash, whether it's the Prophets, whether it's the Writings, whether it's Mishnah, whether it's Talmud, even Kabbalah and Zohar. You're dealing with physical things. Someone loses an object, someone finds it, someone stole it, and someone uh, got hurt, and so on and so forth. Seemingly, it's talking about physical things, but through those physical things, you're able to receive the godly infinite energy. So Torah, again, has both components. It has the component of infinite, the light part, er, but it also has the component where it's kasalma, it's a, uh, a vehicle that we can relate to the materialistic world, and that blends the two. So Torah has, obviously, both parts in it. We're the finite human being, God's infinite, and through Torah, we're able to bridge the gap. So that is the power of Torah. Now, we all know, who did we receive the Torah from? From God. But who did God choose to give us a Torah? God chose to give us a Torah through Moshe Rabbeinu. Through Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, this chapter, even though we're talking about Torah, the, we're going to have a beautiful journey into the Svirot and the Svirot. So let's get ourselves a review of the Svirot so we'll, we'll have a frame of reference. So we know, generally speaking, and again, we're not going to go into a whole in depth class about the Sea Road because it's, that's a class in itself of many classes. But in, for this class, we're going to give an overview of the Sea Road and the worlds. What does that mean like this? God is infinite. God wanted to create a finite world. How do you create from infinite to finite? And again, God could have done it in many ways. But the way God should do it, chose to do it, He, he created a um, step-down process called Sim Tzumim, where God constricted and concealed the infinite light. And the first level we know, in, in a global level, was where God created the world of Atzilut. Atzilut comes from the word of Eitzel, close to God. So that was the first, the first level where it's, it's not infinite, but then again, it's not finite yet. It's called the world of Atzilut. From there, God created the next world called the world of Bria. There's already a creation of some sort, that means there's more of a concealment and more of already starting to create some finite reality. 
Then there's the level of Yitzira, the world of Yitzira already, now there's already not only a creation, but there's already a formation, something's taking shape and form. And then there's something which is called the world of Asiya, the physical world. Those are the four different, come welcome, come inside. Those are the four levels of the way the world comes down from one level to the next. Four, four worlds. Obviously Atsilut being the highest, Bria Yitzira, and Asiya being the lowest physical world. Welcome, welcome, come inside. Okay, those are the four worlds of creation. Now, in each one of these worlds, we know God created a process called the Svirot. And the spherot is the way within the world, within the world, the light goes down from one level to the next, and when it finishes that world, it starts the new world. In other words, in the world of Atsilut, so there's ten spherot. Now there's different ways to count the ten spherot. The difference is whether you count Keter as one of the spherot, and if you do, you don't count Das. Or if you don't count Keter, it starts with Chachman, and you do count Das. For this class, we're going to we're going to take the approach that we count Chachma. So the first sphere is what? Chachma. And we know Chachma, and again, just a brief overview. Chachma is the first sphere. What's the first sphere? Think of it. If you have nothing, so what's the first sphere? Chachma from the word, as Tanya explains, in the first, the first section of Tanya, comes from the word of Chachma. Wow, what is it? Like it was nothing. What is it? Like a flash of light. That's Chachma. From Chachma, you come down to where? To Bina. And a Bina already you have the details, the development, the details of this flash of an idea, whether on whatever level we're referring to. From there you go down to the sphere of Das, where now that you have the flash of an idea and you have all the details, then you gotta start applying to it. I mean you don't want to live in La La Land. So Das is again, Chachma is right oriented, Bina is left oriented, Das is centered, and Das, all the centered sphere are very, very powerful because it centers you. So you take the flash of idea, all the details, and you start applying it, you start meditating. What does it mean practically and what how does it relate to? Um, so Das is a very, very important centered sphere. That finishes the three sphere in the world of intellect. Ideas, details, and applying you know, from an intellectual perspective. From there it starts the emotional spherot, and there it's there's generally seven, and there's many ways to divide it up. We're going to divide up the first way is the emotional spherot, raw emotions, right oriented is chesa, kindness, the ability just to give and give and give and just want to do, not knowing how to say no. A real person of chesa just does not know how to say no. Now, gvura is, the first response is no. Two extremes. Yes. Chas and Gvur, it's two extremes, right and left. Tiferis already is, and again, another, we're not gonna, you can have a whole class about Tiferis, but Tiferis is where it's a blend of the two on one level, or it's where you put yourself in the other person's shoes, and it becomes a beautiful mix, an appropriate amount of yes and amount of no, and that's really beauty. Because just saying yes is yes, but it's not nice. So, sometimes you have to say no. And sometimes saying, just saying no so, is possibly mean. On the other hand, when there's the mix of chesed and vura, when certain things yes, certain things no, and you have the right blend, that's when you have something beautiful. That's the Ferris. That is the world of emotion. So we, we spoke of the raw intellect, raw emotions. Now, intellect emotions is great, but you need to make it practical. So netzach, hoid, yesoid, and malchut, goes into the package of, in the, in the words of Karl, it's called Nehim, where over the year it, cr it takes the intellect, it takes the emotions, and it brings it down into reality. And again, we can have a class in every one of these three wrote. All right, now, so comes along, comes along the Arizal, we all know who the Arizal is, right, from the, from the Kabbalah, and he says like this, that where did the process start? Think about it, what's the highest level? So let's start. The highest level, what's the highest world? The oh, highest world. There's four worlds, Atsilut, Bri, Yitzir, Asiya. So the highest world is the world of Atsilut. Right? The highest world is the world of Atsilut. In the world of Atsilut, what is the highest sphere? We're having a test, if you just remember what I, recall, recall, pop quiz. What, what's the highest sphere we said is? Huh? No, we, okay. You walked in a little late. So he said, for this class, we're not, we're not counting Kesar first, we're counting Chachmas first. All right. So again, so the highest world is Atzilut, and the highest sphere is Chachman. It means it, any process start Now, when you finish the world of Atzilut, so then from the last 
Svira Malchut, and collectively Netzachot Yisro Malchut of that package creates a new world. And the new world of Bria starts again. Chachom Bina Das, Chesky words first, Netzachot Yisro Malchus. When that finishes, boom, a new world, Yitzira, until Asiya, etc. Okay. But the highest world, where it all began, or oh, everything began the infinite, but where it all began a certain level of finite reality, is the highest world is the world of Atzilut and the world of Chachma. Okay. Come, now there's higher than that. There's Adam Kadmo and different levels. Again, that's another the class to go through. I mean, this is heavy, heavy stuff. I'm just going to give you what we need for today's class. Comes along that Rizal, and the Rizal says like this. That Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, the one that taught us all the Torah, did not, in relation to the Torah, did not comprehend the highest level of Chachma and Atzilut. That's what that Rizal says. Where did, uh, where did the Moshe Rabbeinu start comprehending, and we're talking about God, in reference to God's Torah, he started to comprehend from the Chitzonius of Chachma, let me explain, every Sphira has Pneumius and has Chitzonius. Pneumius is the essence of the Sphira, and Chitzonius is the external part of the Sphira. And soon in the class we'll explain more in depth what does it mean internal, external. But let's leave that for soon. But generally speaking, you have the Pneumius of every Sphira, and you have the Chitzonius of every Sphira. Just like, for example, every emotion, everything in life has the Pneumius and has the Chitzonius. For example, let me give a simple example. Um, we observe Shabbat, right? So in observing Shabbat, and you can pick any mitzvah, for example, for, for that matter, when you observe Shabbat, there's the Pneumius of Shabbat, and there's the Chitzonius of Shabbat. What is the Chitzonius of Shabbat? Do this, don't do that, you got to pray here, you got to eat this, and you don't do that, you don't turn the lights. Pne that's the Chitzonius, the technicalities. What's the Pneumius of Shabbat? What's the essence of Shabbat? A day of rest. And you become one with God. So, which part of Shabbos? They're both Shabbos. What, and you should really do both. And if you want to really keep a complete Shabbos, you want to get into the essence of Shabbos, resting from being disconnected from all reality, and connecting with the oneness of God, and then observing what you have to. That's a complete Shabbos. Not complete would be just being spiritual on Shabbat and not doing any of the mitzvot of Shabbat. And God forbid transgressing. Or doing everything and not connecting to the spirit of Shabbat. Which many people do. It's not a judgment, it's a fact. So, but the point is a complete Shabbos is the Pneumius and the Chitonius. So comes that reason he says that Moshe Rabbeinu, his comprehension in reference to the Torah, bringing down Torah to this world, was not in the Pneumius of Chachma Vatzilut, but where was it? It was in the Chitzonius, the external part of the Chachma Vatzilut. I'm bringing you the Ruah Zohar. We have to understand what it means. So he peeled off from the Chitzonius, from the external part of Chachma Vatzilut. I mean, it's still a heavy level. Hello. We're in the world of Asiya. There's Yitzira, Bria, and Atzilut. And in there, all the Sfirot, starting from Malchut all the way up to Chachma, it's pretty high. But his comprehension was not in the internal part of Chachma, it was the external part of Chachma. Now, <coughs> now obviously, if he's saying he didn't comprehend that, that means he didn't even comprehend higher than that. Now, from that external part of Chachma, he drew down the external part of Chachma into Bina. Then, into the seven Sfirot, there's the seven, um, the seven emotional Svirot, Chesedgur, Tferes, Netzachod Yisod, and Malchut, which actually is interesting is that the seven Svirot, what's it called in Kabbalah? It's actually called Ze'er Ampin, the small face. Why is it the small face? Because Ze'er means small. A midah, every midah, has its midah, if it's chesed, if it's gura, if it's teferis. So zerampi means it's a small face, which from there, which from there, you know, think about it. it. Let's think about it for a second. The midot, chesed, gvura, teferis, right, netza, chod, yisod, right, left, centered, yes, nose, compassion, right, a blend. So 
the Arizal says, look in the Torah. Everything, and if you study the Torah, it's either going to say kosher or treif, right? Or pure or impure. What's the source? No, so the chitzoinius, we're learning kosher, non-kosher, pure, impure, do this, don't do that. That's the, that's the, what's what we're learning about. But if you trace it back to its source, what's the source? Think about it. Anytime it says kosher, anytime it says pure, anytime it says do something, where's it coming from? God. Everything's from God. That's the magic answer. God is the magic, God and good is always the magic answer. But where's it coming, what aspect? From the midot? From the right oriented. Think about it. Chassad means, yes, it's kosher, it's pure, um, do it, life is great. That's coming from chassad. But what happens in the Torah when it says, don't do this, it's impure, etc. Punishment, rebuke, that's coming from the left side. <clears throat> so everything gets traced back to the source. So Moshe Rabbeinu, again, his comprehension was the external part of Chachma, which went down to Bina, that's all the ideas and details, went down through the seven Midot, which from there, again, we have the Torah that we have, which is rooted back into the Midot and the Sfirot. Now, but the part that Moshe Rabbeinu had, a, according to the Arizal, a premiistic relationship was, not Chachma, we said already, but the way Chachma comes down to Bina, to the seven Midot, but specifically in the last four Midot. Netzach, Hoid, Yesoid, and Malchut. From the last four Midot. And that's what the Arizal says, that's why it's actually called Noivloid Chachma. What does Novel mean? Fall, it's falling down. The internal part of Chachma is the essence. The external is the part that falls down into the Bina, into, into the Svirot, and into Netzach Hod Yisrael Malchut. And, and, the, and as the author quotes, and he says, we look in the Torah, what does God say to Moshe Reno? Moshe Reno told God, what did Moshe Reno tell God? Moshe Reno tells God, I want to see your face, right? <laughs> what did God tell him? Huh? No. God said, you're going to see behind, Uponai, my face, you're not going to see. It says so straight in the Torah. So the Altar explains, right? That was, what does that mean? Very simple. This will be just like that Rizal said. That he was able to see the achoyrai, the external part of Chachma Vatzilut, and he wasn't able to see the premius of Chachma Vatzilut. That's what the Arizal says, and the Altar explains so. Okay. Comes old, and Altar, and he asks a very simple question. Whoa. We know who is the greatest prophet? Who is the greatest prophet? Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest prophet. So we're talking about the greatest prophet, face to face with God. Whoa, it's pretty heavy. So we're saying he did not comprehend the pnimius of Chachma Vatzilut. Now let's look in the Arizal's teachings. The Arizal's, the other Kabbalist teachings, they teach about Chachma Vatzilut, and they even taught, teach about what's higher than Chachma Vatzilut. Keter of Atzilut is even higher, and other than Kadman and so on and so forth. They teach how much higher levels. So what does that mean? Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet, which is not a, it's not a joke, it's not an exaggeration, it's the truth, came to God face to face. He was not able to comprehend and bring down the level of Chachm of Atzilut from internal. He had the external part. However, that reason was able to go higher than him. You get the question? Powerful question. So the author explains like this. Powerful idea. That the Arizal and all the other Kabbalists, how, how do they study? They use their brain. What's the highest power we have? We have a brain. So they use their Chachma, they use their Bina, their Das, they meditated, and they meditated on the greatest powers of God. Now, what does the altar explain? Very simple. Let's say, I'm, I'm going to give you a mashal. The altar is, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you walk into a, um, a wedding hall. You have been, lately been to weddings, right? You walk into a wedding hall, and we all have ears, right? We have ears. And you walk in, and the music is blasting. But not only is it blasting, they rented these big speakers, these amplifiers, and it's so loud that literally it's pushing you out of the room and you're getting a headache, you're not even enjoying the music. 
You're not enjoying it. It's way too loud. Why? Because, uh, how can it be too loud? And the answer is very simple, because we have ears, right? We have ears, and our ear can only handle so much. So what do you do? You want to stay in the room, you see everyone's dancing and having a good time, you want to stay there, and you just can't handle it. So what do you have to do? You put in earplugs. <laughs> you put in earplugs. Sure. As a matter of fact, at the wedding, they were giving out earplugs, right? <laughs> you put in earplugs. Also, you stuff in these earplugs that knock out 80% of the sound, 80% of the sound. Good. All of a sudden, I like this music. Yeah. I like the music. <laughs> And not only does it knock out 80%, it actually knocks out 80% of all the drums and all the beats. I love it. Let me ask you a question like this. You just knocked out 80% of the music and you love it. When you had 100%, you couldn't handle it. So let me ask you, simple. Where are you appreciating, where are you appreciating the more music? When you walked in and you had 100% or now when you only have 20% of it? When you have 20%. Right. Hello, what is that all about? You had 100%, you couldn't handle it. When you have 20%, 20% of it, you love it. Just like with God. What does that mean, the Ozil says? Very simple. I mean, the doctor explains very simple. The prophets, how did they meditate and understand God? They used their mind. The mind will only take you so far. In depth. That means, just like when you went to that wedding hall with the 80% plugged up, because you had the 20% hearing ability, you're able to enjoy the music. Hello, you're missing out on the whole thing. Every beat, every drum, every cymbal, right? Every note, you're missing the richness, but you're loving it. Why? Because you're able to handle it. Now, the author explains the same thing with the, with the, with the Kabbalists. They understood Chachma Vatsilas. They understood Kasa Vatsilas. Guess why? Because what tools were they using? They were using ear. Hearing. Hearing is a very, very finite, limited way of comprehending. So their comprehension was very limited. And therefore, yeah, they can go very high. Therefore, they can sit there for hours and enjoy the music. However, the altar explains that Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, we, we all know, uh, how did he relate to God? By hearing or by seeing? Huh? Hearing. Moshe Rabbeinu what? No. Moshe Rabbeinu saw God face to face. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have any earplugs. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have any earplugs. He had the real deal. He walked into the wedding hall, no earplugs. Guess what? So did he walk till the, over till the band and tell the speakers? No. If you're wearing earplugs, you can stand right in front of the band. Because you're really not, even though it looks like you're standing, you're not standing in front of the band. You're, you're blocked out 80% of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the music. Moshe Rabbeinu, no earplugs. The raw deal. He saw God face to face. Now when you see God face to face, could a human being see God face to face? Now, he can see more than most people can see. Yeah. But because he's going in raw, he's going in with no filters, so the author explains, yes, exactly, you, you can't, how do you compare the two? The prophets, they're winning 80% plugged out, so they're sure they can talk about Chachma Vatsilas, and yes, they're getting some kind of like a, uh, a camouflaged, packaged up, diluted version of it. Okay. But Moshe, there was no, there was no packaging, there was no uh, filters. He was able to see God face to face, and therefore, could he stand in front of the speakers? They blow, his ears were blown out. So therefore, the Chachma Vatsilos, he couldn't touch because it would totally blow him up. He only got from the external part of Chachma, which had to be diluted down into Bina, which had to go into the Svirot, and then when it went into the seventh Svirot, which are raw, heavy emotions, when it finally got down to the last four, Netzach, Hoy, Yisoyed Malchus, he was able to stand there, no filter, and really appreciate it. So Moshe Rabbeinu's connection to the Sviro, Netzach, Hoy, Yisoyed Malchus, is a whole different reality than, than the Kabbalists. Two different worlds. Now, so therefore, 
what the, what the, what the Arizal says that Moshe Rabbeinu understood from the external part of Chachma, that's really the external part of Chachma. But again, the way it had to be diluted down to Bina and to the emotions until it came down to Netzachal Yisrael Malchus. Now, so one might think, one second, Moshe Rabbeinu only gave us a limited version of the Torah. It got all diluted out because he had to step back because it was too powerful. So the Zohar says as follows. And this is very important. The Zohar says like this. The Torah itself, that means Chumash, uh, Prophets, Writings, Mishnah, the Torah itself is sourced where? Not in the external part of Chachma. In the internal part of Chachma. It's God's Torah. The Torah itself is sourced in God, in, within the essence of God. In Chachma Vatzilut. However, for us humans to walk in and comprehend it, guess what? Could we get it straight from the source without a filter? No. 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 Too, no. Loud, too loud. Exactly. <laughs> that's why, that's why, that's why. Many times you see in the Chumash, it says, Kri and Ksiv. What does that mean? The way it's written and the way you say it. I mean, something could be written one way and said another way. And you always say, like, what's that all about? Write it the way it should be said, or say it the way it's supposed to be written. Like, what's this Kri and Ksiv all about? You've seen that all in the Chumash? You've seen that a lot in the Chumash? You know what I'm referring to? It says you read it this way, but it's, but it's written another way. What is that all about? So the author explains very simple. The way it's written is the way it's written. Meaning to say is, that's the way it's sourced back in Chachma Vatzilut. Highest level. No filters. The problem is when we read it, this doesn't read right. Why? Because we can't comprehend it. We can't handle it. Just like you can't go into a band which is totally blowing out the room without any filters. So therefore, when we read it, we read it in a way where it's toned down and we can appreciate it. So the same thing also. The Torah is source. The Torah itself, when you study the Torah, what are you studying right now? The Torah, the way it's sourced in the highest level. Chachma Vatzilut. The internal part of Chachma Vatzilut. However, when it comes to comprehension, you can only be able to comprehend... 20%. I didn't say 20%. No, you, you, possibly more. You're only able to comprehend when it goes back to start in him, that's Chodj Samachos, the way it goes in the emotions, Bina, and the way it's sourced in the, in the external part of Chachma. Okay. In other words, like this. In other words, like this. To, to clarify. We mentioned before that every sphera has the internal part of the sphera and has the external part of the sphera. What does that mean? Take any sphera, Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, all ten, any of the ten spherot. The internal part of the sphera is true to its source. It's 100% true blue, it's raw, it's complete, not, nothing packaged, nothing, mystery. it's 100% complete because it's connected to its source. The essence of every sphere is connected to its source. Now, because it's connected to its source, it's too powerful for us to touch, to touch, to appreciate, to connect. It's just too powerful for us. So there's something called the chitzonius, the external part of the sphera. What's the external part of the sphera? The part that allows it to come down that we can connect to it. It's like, let's say you want to eat something which is piping hot. You walk over with your hand, touch a hot pot, you're going to get burnt. So there's a glove for a reason in the kitchen, right? You ladies know there's a glove in the reason. What do you need the glove for? Pick it up, because you're going to burn yourself. So you need the glove to grab it. That's the same idea also. You want the thing that's in there, but you can't touch it without a glove. So we want the essence of the sphere, but not every essence here we can touch. It's too powerful. We need to go come on to the, the external part of the sphere, and that allows us to benefit from it. In other words, like this. Take, for example, we all have an Neshama. We all have a soul, a godly soul. The godly soul that we have is what is part of God. Now, the godly soul that we have that's part of God, how do we connect to the godly soul? How do you, we all have a godly soul. How do you connect to the godly soul? Torah. What? Torah. 
Yes, true. To, that's Torah. But how do you connect to your godly soul? Meditation, prayer. Oh. Do mitzvah. Oh, very good, very good, very good, very good. Yes. The way you connect to your godly soul, there's five ways to connect to your godly soul. Connect and express. Connect and express your godly soul. The deepest, the deepest level, the deepest level the way you connect to your godly soul is very simple. Use your mind. Think. Not thought. Intellect. There's a difference between thought and intellect. When you use your intellect, you connect to your godly soul. In other words, if I ask you a question and you give me an impulse reaction, that's not going to be your godly soul. If you want to know what your godly soul has to say, say, let me think about it. Could you push a button and start thinking? No, it doesn't work that way. You can push a button and start feeling. And that's dangerous. Because it's not coming from your godly soul. Very good chance. So the way to connect and to express what's from your neshama is by intellect, by thinking. That's why if anyone ever asks you a question, the safest way, if you want to know what God is, is to say, let me think about it. Sometimes it takes a minute, which is very rare. It usually takes a couple hours, maybe a day or two. And what happens is, as you, the more you think about it, the, the, you're going to come with it. When you, you think about when you study Torah. You just read it? No, you've got to think. I mean, as you use your brain, it, that's when you're plugging into your godly soul. That's how you connect, and that's how you express it. That's the deepest way. Now, from there, goes to your emotions. You have a godly idea, and then guess what happens? If you have a god, for example, uh, we're now in the month of Adar, right? So our neshama knows it's the month of Adar, but we, when you start thinking and studying about the month of Adar, now you're connecting your neshama to the month of Adar, and then you express it. What happens as you meditate and study about it, use your intellect, what happens to your emotions? Start dancing, I, uh, right? It's the month of Adar. You get excited about it. <coughs> then, as you get excited about it, then you start thinking about it. Before it was intellect. Now it's just machshavot, thoughts, right? Thoughts about how you want to celebrate, how you're going to celebrate, what you're going to do, and so, thoughts, thoughts about Adar. Then, you call your friend, or your, or your spouse, your children, your parents, your, your people in the community, you talk about it. And then you actually start moving, you start dancing, right? So in other words, the neshama is the, the depth of you. It goes from a process, from intellect to emotions to thought, speech, and action. Which one is closest to your neshama, intellect or action? Which one? Intellect. Intellect. That's the first, the first, the first step away. Intellect. Action is the furthest. But the fact is, we're living in this physical world, and the way to connect to your neshama is, is through doing physical things. Yeah. So, in other words, the, the the essence of the sphere is sometimes we can't touch, but the external part is what we touch. So, if you want to be happy, and you study about being happy, and you don't start dancing, there's <laughs> it's it, there's a disconnect. disconnect. It's not flowing right. So you need it to flow down to the world of action. So in other words, so it's not about just keeping it there, it's about bringing it all the way down. And this is the power of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Altar explains. Moshe Rabbeinu was able to ascend to the highest level that a human can ascend in terms of seeing, not by stuffing ears and hearing, like the Kabbalists. He's able to the highest level. The highest level that it's that where it starts the process of revealing is the chitzainis, as we said, of the sphera. Not that he couldn't reach the internal part. The inter internal part of that sphere is not meant to be revealed. The Torah is connected to it. But that part, we cannot comprehend it. And Moshe Rabbeinu's job was to bring down from the external part of Chachma into Bina, into Das, into the emotions, down into this physical world. Why? As we see, the purpose is for it to fall down into the physical world, up to doing mitzvot. And also, as we know, for example, Talmud says, what's greater? Studying Torah or doing mitzvot? And what's the resolution? That it goes back and forth. And the end is that Talmud is greater. Why? Because it causes you to do mitzvot. So the net effect, really, it's the action. The net effect's the action. Talmud is greater because it will cause you to do mitzvot. But at the end, you need to do the mitzvot. Not only that, and I'm going to share with you what the Altar says here, it's very, very powerful and very profound. 
You ready for this? The altar, the altar quotes from the Arizal. And the Arizal says, straight Kabbalah, every single person comes down to this world with a mission, a shopping list. On the, you know what's on the shopping list? Not the fish for Shabbos. <laughs> Maybe there too. Actually, it's probably there. In like in a uh, really a sea away. It's true. It's a sub list, right? Okay. But what's on? No, it is on the sub list. Um, but what is, what is, what's on your list? What's your shopping list? From you, when you come down to this world, you're born into this world. You were given a shopping list. What's on the shopping list? Come on, you guys are smart. To love God and love each other. True. Six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. Yeah. Six hundred and thirteen. Now, some of them you do many times, and some of them you get the opportunity once in your lifetime to do it. And then there's 248 positive, 36 negative. Comes along that result, the result sells. Guess what? Every person comes down and has to get a check by every one of those. <laughs> so, what happens? You live your whole life, 80, 100, or 120 years, you live a whole life, and you got checks on 612 of them. That's pretty good. I'll Pretty see. good, right? You're that. missing one. You know what that result says? Guess what? Come, Come back down. Come back down again, because you got to do that one more. So there's no, you think, eh, I'll do it tomorrow. Hello? You're going to come back. Why come back through the whole process? Get it done the first time right. Get it done the first time right. Why? Now, why is that so important? You have to get a check on each one. Because the main reason why we're down here is what? To do mitzvot. We study and we're happy, but the goal is to do the mitzvot. And if and when we do the mitzvot, we're done. Our, our mission is over. And we have to come back. And if not, we come back. So the job of Moshe Rabbeinu was to bring down the highest level of intellect that's possible for a human to comprehend, bring it down into the world of action, so that we can do our mitzvot. Now, after we finish it off, it's actually an, an addendum to this chapter, and he says, for example, we see that there's different levels of energy. So for example, there's levels of energy that's created by our thought. We have thoughts, that's one level of energy. There's speech, right, that's another level of energy. There's action, another level of energy. And then he says that, for example, even in thought, there's multiple levels of the thought, energy and thought. Because for example, there's thought that's based on actions, there's thought based on speech, and there's thought that's based on thought. Everything creates energy and everything receives energy. There's nothing that just happens by itself. So the opposite is what happens on a person, so for, based on that, everything requires specific energy. And which is here is a profound idea, based on we all know that, according to, that there's no such thing as multitasking. You can toggle between two things, but multitasking doesn't exist. Either you're thinking, or you're talking, or you're doing. So the author says, why? You find people, they can think, and do something else at the same time or talk something else at the same time. The author says, no, it's not really true. Why? Because if you're thinking about something, how are you talking about that? The only reason why you're talking or doing it because you had that energy of that speech or that action already before it existed. The only thing was that it didn't spill out in reality. But everything has to come from somewhere. Everything comes from somewhere. And the example he gives is that, for example, just like we said that Moshe Rabbeinu brought it down to he had an in-depth connection to the last four spheres, and that's a Chod Yisom Malchut, and that causes the creation of the new world. So everything comes from the end of the line of the sphere, and that's a Chod Yisom Malchut, and that brings it down into reality in this world. Okay. So, in other words, you see like this. This chapter is a beautiful chapter for many reasons. Many reasons. Number one is, it shows you the power of Torah. That the power of Torah in itself is extremely powerful. It goes up to the essence of Chachma Vatzilut. So every time you're studying Torah, you are connecting to what? Literally, to the essence of Chachma in the world of Vatzilut. Very powerful. Number two is, not only that you're, you're connecting there, but we have the power to comprehend, maybe not necessarily that highest level, but we can bring down from the close to the highest level, in, in reality, from um, in the external part of Chachma, through Bina, through emotions, into this physical world, and by bringing down the energy into this physical world, we're able to fulfill our mission in this world, and our mission in this world is to make sure to do all the mitzvot. And if we do all the mitzvot, guess what? We'll be done with our mission, 
and we want it to come back. And more importantly, we'll cause the God, godly light to come down to this world, and we'll all merit for all of us to finish our mission, and then we can have, obviously, the Messiah coming. So it's a great chapter. And I think when you study this chapter, it gives you a whole different appreciation of studying Torah. Because you realize when you're studying Torah, you're connecting to the greatest, greatest, greatest powerful source, but also it allows you to focus that when you're studying Torah, you're actually bringing down God's light literally into the physical world, and specifically, to, Torah is supposed to inspire you not to stay in abstract world, but to actually do mitzvot. It means if you're studying Torah, it should inspire you to do mitzvot. How many mitzvot? And which mitzvot? And the answer is all mitzvot.